Today on Earth Focus, Dr. Michael Mann looks at future impacts of climate change. Coming up on Earth Focus. One of the valid, in my view, uh, criticisms of the IPCC is that in many respects it has been overly conservative in um, the way it has stated its conclusions. And there's no better example than uh, the melting of ice, both sea ice, the layers of ice that form seasonally in, in the uh, Arctic and, the, and around Antarctica, and land ice, the, the major ice sheets, the continental ice sheets, like the Greenland ice sheet and the Antarctic ice sheet. In both respects, both in terms of the shrinking amount of sea ice, for example, in the Arctic um, at the end of the summer, the current trajectory that we're on leads to the conclusion that within a matter of a couple decades, we may see ice-free conditions in the Arctic at the end of the summer. Um, this is something that the climate models predict shouldn't happen for another 60 years till the end of the 21st century. And indeed, uh, nature seems to be on a course that's faster, that's more dramatic than what the climate models uh, predict. We are already uh, observing and measuring a decrease in the amount of ice in the Greenland ice sheet and the West Antarctic ice sheet. Now the climate models have predicted that we shouldn't see that for many decades to come. And a key distinction here is if it's a land ice sheet, a land-based ice sheet, then when it melts it actually contributes to global sea level rise. That's not the case for sea ice, but it is the case for the continental ice sheets. And so the fact that we're already measuring uh, losses of ice from these major continental ice sheets means that they're contributing to sea level rise faster, once again, than climate scientists projected them to. There's a credible body of work now that suggests that if we continue with business as usual fossil fuel emissions, then by the end of this century we could see as much as two meters, six feet of global sea level rise. Um, now that would be catastrophic for many coastal regions, for the U.S. East Coast and Gulf Coast, island nations around the world, which some of which will literally be submerged by that amount of sea level rise. The IPCC makes a far more conservative statement. Uh, they state an upper bound of about a meter, about three feet. Um, and it's once again an example of where the IPCC arguably has been overly conservative. Some, as myself, have argued that uh, partly that's just due to the culture of science. Scientists tend to be reticent. We don't like to make strong conclusions that we have to uh, withdraw at some later time. And there's also a component, I, I believe, due to the pressure, the outside pressure, the critics, uh, a very well-funded and, and well-organized effort to literally discredit the science of climate change, sometimes by attempting to discredit the scientists themselves. Uh, I, I myself have been a victim of that. And in the face of all that pressure and those attacks, I think to some extent the IPCC has actually withdrawn a bit and they've been uh, more guided, uh, more guarded, uh, more conservative, more reticent in what they're w willing to conclude than they really should be given the evidence. And arguably, you know, if it is indeed the IPCC's role to advise governments on the potential for danger, dangerous anthropogenic interference with the climate, which is what the IPCC was originally uh, charged with as their mission, um, arguably you should not sort of downplay the higher end scenarios if they're credible, even if they're low probability outcomes. Um, if their probability isn't zero, then they should contribute to the assessment of risk, much in the way that you know, we buy fire insurance for our homes, not because we think our homes are going to burn down. That's a very rare occurrence. It's very unlikely to happen to us. But even though its probability is very low, the magnitude of cost, the impact on our lives if our house was to burn down, is immeasurable. Mitigating climate change, doing something about our carbon emissions, is a planetary insurance policy. And in guiding the terms of that insurance policy, we need to be focusing on some of those potential more extreme catastrophic outcomes. Uh, if the IPCC systematically downplays those outcomes, then it doesn't serve that larger process of societal risk assessment as it should. 
qualitatively speaking, um, if you look at um, impacts on human health, uh, water availability, uh, human water resources, food resources, land, the global economy, pretty much every sector of our lives, of human civilization, what you see is a business as usual fossil fuel burning scenario by the end of the century gives us highly negative impacts across the boards in all those categories. Uh, I forgot to mention biodiversity, a potentially large uh, scale extinction of, of species. Um, some of these we can quantify economically or we can try to. Some of them we, we can't even qualify how important they are. What is the value of the earth? Well it's infinite because if we destroy the earth's environment there is no plan B. There's no planet B that we can go to. How do you put a cost on, you know, on the health of the environment? Arguably, you can't even do so. Um, and in fact, it's that principle, that it's an infinite cost, when we start talking about those sorts of scenarios, that leads uh, some people to uh, you know, conclude that the precautionary principle applies here, that the potential impact of what we're doing is so potentially harmful to us, to other living things, to the planet, that it's almost uh, obvious that we need to mitigate this problem, that we need to take actions now to avert those catastrophic futures, potential futures. Airwaves, a global channel of uncompromising stories. World news, documentaries, entertainment, and culture. Link TV, connecting you to the world. For more information, visit linktv.org.